All right. Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have Katie Gaddy, who is the host of the Money with Katie show. As many of you know, it's one of the top 25 business podcasts, and it was actually purchased by Morning Brew this year, which is incredible. But actually more pertinent and more interesting to our conversation here today is that Katie is a longtime listener of Choose a Fi, and she found personal finance and certainly financial independence through Choose a Fi in 2018 in her early 20s. So she has an incredible story of the Fi journey. Coming in, you have a, a normal to low income. Where do you start? And where do you go from there as your career expands, as your options expand? What does your Fi journey look like then? So this should be a lot of fun. Welcome to Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Katie, welcome to Choose of I. This should be a lot of fun. I'm excited to have you here. Thanks so much, Brad. I'm just beaming. This is such a full circle moment for me. So thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, well, thanks for being here. This has been quite a year for you, right? <laughs> so if I remember correctly from a, a Twitter post, I think I saw a billboard in Times Square <laughs> with your face on it. Yeah, well, now, it turns out they'll let anyone on a billboard if you pay them <laughs> enough money. But uh, yeah, it was that was a pretty surreal moment. This has been quite the year. That's an understatement for sure. Yeah, it's wild. But what a journey in four years. So I think you said you told me you found Jesus of I when you're turning just about 23. So essentially just out of college and just getting started with your adult life at that point. How do you find personal finance? What did your journey look like at the beginning? Well, it's funny because I think I think everybody finds at some point in their life that they have a financial awakening. And you just pray that it happens early enough for you to course correct and really take advantage of the amount of time you have left. But for some people, that financial awakening happens two years before retirement where they realize, oh my God, I haven't really prioritized this and I don't really know what's going to happen next. So I feel very fortunate that in my early 20s, I kind of had that, I will call it a realization or a little voice, a little knowing that as I was working full time and kind of going about my life that I didn't really have a plan. I just felt like, hey, as long as there's enough money at the end of the month to pay off my Discover bill and to pay my rent on the first, I'm good. And if that means that, you know, I uh, am just shuffling an indiscriminate and, you know, reactive amount of money into savings every month, cool. I'll worry about all this later. But there came a point where I started to realize that just going along to get along, just riding that treadmill wasn't a very satisfying way to progress. And I kind of had that, oh crap moment that I think so many of us have after working full time for some period of time. Mine just so happened to happen six months into working full time (laughs) where I was like, oh my God, do I have to do this for the rest of my life? Like that random Tuesday morning where you're walking into work and you're like, uh, oh shit. Like I'm giving this place the best hours of my day during the best days of my week, during the best years of my life. And I don't really feel like I have anything to show for it. So I started to put out those feelers with friends and somebody, one of my friends in my network said, hey, I think you should really listen to this podcast. I think this will help you a lot. They sent me a link to Choose FI. And from the first episode, I was hooked. And I think the reason that I got hooked was because the way the topics were approached felt very friendly and accessible. And It just didn't make me feel stupid for not knowing the stuff already, but it was kind of, I felt like I was learning alongside you and Jonathan. So I have really taken that ethos, I think, into my brand and my content with wanting people to feel like they're learning alongside me too, because I think we're all students of life and money and no one comes out of the womb knowing what to do with money. Like everyone has to learn it. So the the assumption that you would just know somehow is 
crazy. But yeah, that was kind of how things got started. And it was a rabbit hole that I have not yet crawled out of since then. <laughs> yeah, 600 plus episodes later. And <laughs> we were talking about our podcast consumption before we hit record here. So I know you're as uh, prodigious of a podcast consumer as I am at this point. Yeah, it's interesting looking back at those early days, just the experiments in financial independence. I mean, that's how we conceived of this show, because I think it's so important to not be an expert right? Like nobody relates to an expert because that's someone up on high, somebody who has some, I, I don't know, some other. And I think people and the world runs on stories. It really does. Right. And like that connection is so important that, Hey, listen, I've made mistakes financially. I've made catastrophic mistakes as I've talked about so many yeah. times here on the podcast with, with my real estate speculation in my twenties. <laughs> so I was screwing up royally, costing myself <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Somehow or another, you had the wherewithal to, to have that thought. And I, I do want to drill down on that real quick. So there was no like exogenous, like outside shock that happened to you six months in, right? It was just like, was it just a general discontent? Yes, definitely. So to drill down, I think I have always been the type of person who was very goal oriented and very motivated by goals. So in school, what that looked like and the form that that took was, well, I want to have a 4.0. I want to graduate valedictorian, which I didn't, but I, you know, I wanted to. I was shooting for it. I had that very hyper competitive, goal oriented approach to life. And part of that, I think, disposition was, well, what's next? What's next? I'm always kind of future focused, for better or worse, something I meditate on frequently. But <laughs> once I got into the workforce, I kind of realized. There isn't a next semester or a next syllabus, or there's no game plan or rubric here that I can follow to check the boxes, get the A, and move on. So I think that kind of extended period of just, oh, this is just life now. Like, yes, my career will have, there'll be a trajectory, there will be a ladder, there's always a next rung on that ladder to strive for. But the corporate politics, I would say, of that striving and the kind of monotony of corporate life. And I loved my company. I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that I wasn't enjoying my workplace or my team, but there is a certain monotony that follows with working a nine to five, particularly when you're young. And I think it was just that general feeling of, you know, mm, something's missing. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm liking it, but I just feel like my life is just this constant, like, get up, go to work, come home, eat dinner, drink wine, watch TV, go to sleep, and then live for the weekends, do it all over again. And that just was very uninspiring to me for the next few decades. I felt very kind of mm, claustrophobic around that idea. So when I discovered financial independence, it was this, this beautiful goal that I felt I could have this data-driven approach to reaching. And it kind of, you know, not to sound too existential, but it definitely reinstilled this sense of purpose and meaning and kind of this grander plan, I think, in my life that I will reference as like the red pill. Like I kind of saw through the matrix and was like, oh my God, there's another way. There's a better way. And it was just, it just gripped me so much when I discovered it. Yeah. I love that. I call it like how I conceptualize it is winning the game of life. Mm-hmm. Right? Because, and, and it's similar in a, in a respect yeah. to what you're saying, Heather, like you goal oriented, hyper competitive. I think I'm probably similar to you in that, like in my former version or like what I like to conceive of as my former version, I was this like super competitive person. And I like, I look back on that, you know, similar to you. And, and I think I actually wanted to drill down on your college decision and such, but like same deal. Like I did really well in high school. I got accepted to Ivy League schools and, and things like oh that. Oh my goodness. Like, Good for you. That's amazing. Well, I guess. I don't know. But it seemed like a win, right? Yeah. And and I realized that that wasn't the game that I really wanted to be playing. And I, it, it took me a lot of years to realize that. But I think just, I don't know, just what are you optimizing for? Oh, beautiful question. And I ask myself this all the time because I think there is a very grand irony in the fact that, I know we'll get into this probably in a little bit, but the fact that my own desire to be freed of forced paid labor or paid labor for the sake of survival, that that then transmuted into, I'm going to start money with Katie. I'm going to do my own little choose FI venture and document this process and try to teach other young women what I'm learning. The fact that that then became my full-time job and has now kind of 
been my meal ticket to be financially independent, but also on the flip side of that, that, you know, beautiful, amazing best case scenario, it also has really become my purpose and in some ways my identity. And I think that has been something that I've had to wrestle with now of what am I optimizing for? Now that I have all the money I need, now that I have my dream job, I'm doing the thing that I would be doing anyway, even if I weren't being paid for it. What else is out there? What is my purpose? So I think I'm optimizing for a life wherein I can pursue that question without feeling encumbered by, I'm going to sound super millennial and say like society's expectations, but like by kind of the more pressing lower Maslow's hierarchy of needs needs of like, you know, if you have all the money that you need, well, now what do you want to do with your life? You wake up tomorrow, pretend you've got a hundred million dollars in a brokerage account. What are you going to do that day? Like your needs are met. And I think that so many of us for that very reason, it can be kind of scary to even face that question head on. And we choose to busy ourselves with things like work or things that are a little bit more down to earth because it's, almost too bright to look at, to be like, well, what is my purpose? Like, I don't know. That's, it's almost easier to stay stuck kind of in the weeds because it's, it's a known quantity. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. I, I think, right, there's that side. There's multiple sides of the coin, right? There's that. And there's obviously, as we certainly know, most people, the biggest stressor in their lives, it's money, right? right? And it truly is a fight or flight scenario where if all you can think about is the financial situation, the negative financial situation you're in, there's no possibility that you can take that step back and survey your life and say, what do I want to get out of my life? And I know yeah. like you're kind of mockingly saying it's like a, a, a very millennial thing, but, but it's a very human thing, right? Yeah. Like it's, I think we all want to live lives of consequence in some way, right? We all want to add value to the world. We all want to spend our time in a like a not frivolous manner. And I think working full time, it feels very frivolous a lot of the time. And I think that's what you were getting at, right? Exactly. Of like the 40 year career. Particularly in some of these white collar jobs. Uh, one of my friends, Jack Rains, he writes an amazing blog called Young Money. And he wrote a post about this recently where he said, it's not that millennials and Gen Z don't want to work or that they're lazy. It's that so many of the jobs available to us are, I call them fake email jobs. I think he was calling them BS jobs, <laughs> kind of these things where you know that if you just disappeared tomorrow and went away and weren't doing it anymore, absolutely nothing would change. There would be no consequence to that organization. And so when you feel like you're kind of like, <laughs> I don't call myself this sometimes, but you feel like you're a spreadsheet monkey. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, that's going to be automated right. someday. You're, oh, you easily. You don't feel like that white collar job has meaning. And so in some, you know, not working with your hands, you're not maybe impacting other people directly. It's like if your job is to make a massive corporation incrementally more money, it doesn't surprise me at all that people feel this lack of meaning and purpose because we're so disconnected from meaningful work. At least I think many of us are. And typically those are the jobs that pay really well and are, are relatively low effort compared to even like service industry jobs that are extremely difficult. And don't pay very well. So I think as a society, we almost have some of these things backwards with how much value we're assigning to certain things, which I could rant about all day. So I'll cut myself <laughs> off there. Yeah. Well, you said a couple of minutes ago, you put out feelers with friends. And I'm actually curious what that looked like, because I think so many of us, no matter what stage we're at in our lives, and obviously I'm a decent bit older than you, but a lot of people, friends of mine are just not content with their lives. And I think we all just kind of internalize it and we don't necessarily talk about it. But I wonder, okay, you're 22, 23, you're starting this this job, you're out of college, you're, you know, super excited, you've succeeded according to everything society said. And now you're this spreadsheet monkey or whatever you yeah. called it, right? Was that feelers with friends, like conversations of like, hey, are you feeling this lack of something? Or or was it more like, hey, how can I get ahead? Funny. Was it nuts and bolts or was it more of like an existential type thing? I would say that I put out both kinds of feelers, but definitely with respect to the existential questioning, that was something that at 22, I didn't really have the words for in the moment. It was more a sense, a felt sense that now in retrospect, I can recognize and name and identify. But at the time, it was more that general discontent that I didn't really know how to approach. So my 
method for approaching it or my tactic for approaching it was turning to nuts and bolts and saying, maybe I'm feeling this way because I don't have a plan. Where do I feel like my life is kind of floaty? Oh, personal finance. That's the area that feels like it needs work. So I and I hate to even admit this because I feel like it perpetuates a stereotype that I don't want to perpetuate, but I kind of asked male and female friends about their financial habits and hey, how much are you making? Like, do you think I'm making enough? Like, how much are you saving every month? What are you investing? How are you investing? What is investing? Like, I asked those types of questions of my peer group and by and large, you know, I got blank stares from the women and it was the men that were, I'm on Robin Hood. I'm buying this. I'm trading that. Oh, I'm using Betterment because they do this. And so I had this one friend who we weren't even that close. His name's Landon. Shout out Landon if you're listening. I don't know if you still listen, but he was the one that sent me Choose FI. And he would be the one that periodically would send me a link to something like Betterment and say, you know, they'll do it for you. And I'm like, well, how is this different from Robin Hood? Oh, well, this is why. And I could kind of bounce questions off of him because he was interested in personal finance too. He would send me articles to Mad Scientist's blog, to Brandon's site. And when I would read Brandon's work, particularly about tax hacking and such, it just was so far over my head. It was so, it it was just so far beyond me at that time. And so now I, I really look back on that and smile and feel quite accomplished that now that's the type of stuff that I really enjoy doing the most. And we'll read irs.gov for fun. But I think that really signals growth and I'm thankful that I did have guy friends at the time where some of them were giving me terrible advice, you know, trading options. But that was kind of part of the impetus that I had really when I was starting Money with Katie was I always came back to that memory of my female friends being like, huh, what are you talking about? Like, and just feeling this deep compulsion of I have to share this with them and all the other young women like me and like them who maybe don't have a Landon who are just going to give them information freely and send them links to podcasts and articles that, you know, I don't want them to look up 30 years from now and not be able to retire. Like that's my worst nightmare for my generation. Yeah. It's also, uh, I'm struck by the fact that like the ripple effects that we can have, right? Like finding that Landon and shout out to Landon for, right? Like think about the ripple effects that he's had just from having a conversation with his friend, Katie. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. If I think about it too much, it makes me emotional (laughs) because it just is so like, what a responsibility then to know that your life and your decisions can have that much of a wide reaching impact on people. It's kind of mind boggling. Yeah, I hear you. And I think, you know, another thing I was struck by is trust your gut feeling. Mm, Yes. Right. Like, I think you and I probably both conceive of ourselves as very analytical people, but, but I think something I've, I've really come to trust in my life is that gut feeling. And you just like, you have to lean into it. And it's hard as like a science and math person to, to really come to grips with that. But I know I had that same thing when I was starting my first job, I guess, as an accountant. And mine was more of that kind of exogenous shock, you know, with my, it's like a historical event at this time, but I worked for <laughs> Arthur Anderson and, yeah. oh. <laughs> uh, which was insane. It was, you know, go to work at the best accounting firm in the world. And then nine months later, that firm does not exist. Yeah. It's like world it's, yeah, it's groundbreaking. <laughs> it's insane. Right. But like even predating that, like I, I kind of realized the impermanence of work, mm-hmm. the impermanence wow. of all these people who were successful on paper, they were partners, they were senior managers at this amazing firm and poof, their job was gone. Right. And if they were living paycheck to paycheck, even at a very nice income, they're not wealthy. They're stressed constantly. I mean, right. Like, think about that. So, I had a very formative moment at a similar age to you, though. Yeah. I guess, unfortunately, mine was more of this external shock. But, but I wanted to, as as you know, we kind of veer in between the theoretical, but and the very (laughs) tactical. So, I said a couple minutes ago, I wanted to talk about your, your college. I noticed on your LinkedIn profile that, you were a presidential scholar and out of state. So you went to a college out of state, but you were a presidential scholar and had a full tuition scholarship. So that is correct. I love that you did your homework, Brad. Yeah. Hey, you got it. <laughs> but you also mentioned, okay, you you might not have been the valedictorian, but I suspect you were you were rather close. You're you did quite, quite well in high school. So talk me through the decision to not go to I mean, certainly you went to the University of Alabama. This is not private information, obviously, but I suspect that you could have gotten into quote unquote better schools, if you will, Mm -hmm, right? So mm -hmm. full tuition scholarship, you're one of the best students at Alabama. Talk me through that decision because that's a pretty intelligent decision for a 17, 18 year old kid to make, 
right? I'd love to hear a little bit of, of the tactics of that because I think that can be really helpful for a lot of people. Yeah. So it's interesting. I went to a private all-girl Catholic high school. I was very blessed, honestly, that my parents prioritized my education. And I was an only child of two college-educated people. So I got a lot of attention and a lot of nurturing and a lot of that kind of message over and over again growing up education is very important. Like this is something to really care about, to pay attention to. So it, I was kind of always predisposed to care and to try really hard in school, frankly. And so when I got to, I was like sophomore, junior year of high school and the college conversation started, this would have been in 2011, 2012. So only a few years after the great recession and the housing market crash. Leading up to high school, my parents were always like, you can go anywhere you want. You can go to Harvard. You can go to Yale. You can do anything. You can be a doctor. Like they were very encouraging of kind of following that path. And they would tell me, you know, we have a 529 account for you. We have been saving and investing for your college education since you were born. So a great deal of privilege in that ability and that kind of open opportunity to do whatever I wanted. 2008 wiped out a lot of that fund. And as we all know, since then, everything has recovered spectacularly. But in the years following, things weren't really back to where they had been. Not to mention when my parents kind of were instilling this message in me of you can go anywhere you want, you can go anywhere you want. That's like early 2000s. Well, by 2012, I think the year over year tuition growth at all of these schools is like 20% year over year. So, so like planning to send your kid to Harvard when she's five is very different than 13 years later, particularly in the 21st century. So <laughs> that conversation quickly changed from like, you can go to Harvard to you can go to a state school with a scholarship. <laughs> so yeah. fortunately, though, my grades were good. So I, um, for whatever reason, you know, in Northern Kentucky, where I lived, Alabama was recruiting very heavily, like they had a lot of resources going into getting kind of top students from that region. And I learned through another student that if you had a 3.8 GPA or above and a 32 on your ACT or above, they would just give you full scholarship. Like you didn't have to write any essays. You did. It was just like you check these two boxes and you're good. And I believe that still stands. I haven't heard otherwise. So I would say I don't know that people are necessarily aware of that. So I kind of heard about that. I was like, that's interesting. It, you know, it was eight hours from home. My parents took me down there for a visit. And I mean, that school, it's the Disneyland of colleges. So I wouldn't even say that it was like, you know, oh, this 17-year-old is so wise and so forward thinking. It was just like, I just saw the football stadium and the sorority houses. And I was like, <laughs> I'm going here. Like, this looks great. So I had a fantastic college experience and you know, was very lucky to not take on any debt because my tuition was paid for and my parents covered my room and board and things of that nature. So it just worked out really well. And when I went to college, I didn't really know what I wanted to study yet. I wanted to be a dermatologist and then realized that I like faint at the sight of blood. So I was like, I don't think medical school is going to be for me. And so, you know, someone had told me back then, well, if you want to make money writing, you should study public relations. And I was like, Great, cool. And so I, you know, find out after declaring that major that Alabama has like a top five program for PR. So I'm like, well, that worked out. Like I didn't even know that when I decided right. to come here. And then I graduated and find out, you know, what PR people make. And I'm like, never mind. I don't think that's gonna work for me. So kind of made that like pivot pretty immediately into like marketing and advertising and, and use that degree to kind of position myself for an internship where and I could then go into a, a you know slightly adjacent but higher paid field. But I mean, it was a fantastic experience. And I I don't think I was aware at the time just how fortunate I was or how much of a different path I was going to be on because of that choice. Like I didn't fully appreciate the student loan crisis at the time just because we never really even entertained the conversation in my family that we would take out loans for anything. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's such an interesting conversation. Obviously, we spent so much time on on Choose a Vibe talking yeah. about about scholarships and just the ROI of college. But yeah, I, I would love. I still one of my goals in this entire project is to like aggregate all of these amazing college scholarships that exist. Right, like you're talking about, like, like University of Alabama. Like that would be amazing if we had just a list of a hundred of these things. We had Noah and Becky way back when, probably four or five years ago talk about like the caddy scholarship that they got to like Purdue, I think it was oh because they were golf caddies. That's it was amazing. Just like, right? Like all of these things exist, but 
nobody's really aggregating it. And I'm also struck by like, as you're talking about your parents, right? So like they were, I, I'm thinking about like my own age now and, and my, yeah, my daughter, your who's daughter. 14, is going to college in four years and how you're kind of a product of your time and your environment. And they went through when they were young adults, basically. I know you probably don't think of them like that because they're your parents, right? And they always so seem weird. so old. Like you existed before me. It's weird. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. But like, you know, they went through the 2000, 2001 bubble. They went through the 2008. I mean, that's and sure, it's interesting just even to see their own kind of messaging to you change from, hey, we've got an unlimited, jokingly, we've got an unlimited budget. You can go anywhere. We're saving dutifully to, hey, look, the real world has intervened. The facts on the ground have changed. And I think I think the facts on the ground are always changing. I think that's something we all We all need to be aware of how it impacts us, both mentally, but I guess really practically as well. That's really fascinating. I I definitely, on that note, am struck by my parents were always very honest with me about money and you know how much my high school cost, or how much money my dad was making, or how much money my mom made before she quit to stay home, and then she went back to work to become a teacher's aide, and how much she was being paid for that. So I feel like even though my parents were very I will say my mom was, uh, she's like the queen of the spreadsheet. Every time they'd spend money on anything, she'd be sitting there like punching in the numbers into Excel <laughs> and, you know, tracking everything back to 2000. So I think I definitely get some of that from them. But I, I, it's funny because I don't know that we talk about this very often that you, you really are a product of your environment. If your parents are very avoidant around money and they never talk about it or anytime money comes up in the house, it's a fight or it's tense. Like you internalize that as a kid who was just mirroring everything these two adults or one adult in your life is doing. And so I feel like I didn't have a lot of the money hangups that I think some of my peers do or people that I'll talk to who had, I don't want to say like traumatizing financial experiences as kids, but kind of where they were at the mercy of the whiplash of their parents' extreme spending and then, you know, being jobless and they ought to sell the house. Like you, if that's your experience, it just influences your own perception so much. And so I do think that the lens that I have was just fundamentally framed by the way that they treated money to me and the way that it was always positioned to me growing up as this, it's just like a fact of life. It's just something you talk about and it's something you're transparent about and you don't spend more than you make and you pay off your credit cards in full every month. And it was just kind of like, that's just what you do. And so when those things are presented as factual to you as a kid, you're like, okay, that's just how it is. You almost don't even think to question it. Yeah. And those financial basics, I mean, just even that, right? So that puts you so far ahead of the game. Absolutely. But like you said 10 minutes ago, even still at 22, you don't know what you're doing. None none of us do essentially, right? So it's such an interesting thing that like you can from on a percentile basis be so far ahead just from laying the groundwork from, okay, my parents are responsible. They taught me you have to pay your bills on time. Don't overspend on your credit card. These kind of things that seem common sense, but it's not inherent common sense. I mean, that was taught to you, but then you've got to move on from there. So you fast forward, you're in your early twenties, you're making an income and okay, I understand this, but what the heck do I do now? As you said, like you're this type A striver who wants to like check boxes and achieve like where do I go from here? And I'm curious, like when you graduated college, did you start spending and then have to like significantly and have to dial it back? Or were you kind of frugal from the outset? No, not naturally frugal whatsoever. I still to this day credit my frugal revolution to the Choose FI interview with Mrs. Frugal Woods. Really? And that was such a light bulb moment for me. I have no idea. But I when I tell you that it just shifted everything in like the course of an hour, I was sitting there just mind blown. And so I've never been naturally frugal. I've never been a saver. That was something that my parents worried about growing up, that money would burn a hole in my pocket. It was gone as soon as I got it. And when I started working and had this paycheck, I was like, sweet, I'm going out to lunch every day. I'm getting Starbucks every morning. I'm I'm living large, baby, because I'm making 52K. <laughs> I'm, I got Kardashian money now and I'm going to spend like a real housewife. Because to me at the time, the thought process was, well, what difference does it make if I spend it now or spend it later? Like, I'm either going to spend this dollar today or I'm going to spend this dollar five years from now. So why wouldn't I just spend it today? What I was missing was that crucial piece of information about compounding in time 
of well, no, 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 because a dollar that you don't spend today can be $10 30 years from now. That kind of deferred gratification that, you know, I always tell people that I think are struggling from that same feeling that I was having, like, hey, investing in your 20s is like in the fitness world. If you could have a six pack by age 30 that you could never work out again, and by age 50, you would have an eight pack, like you would have it for the rest of your life. Like imagine that level of kind of front loading and how magical that is. And I just didn't have the knowledge of kind of the power of the relentless wealth building machine that is the stock market, um, which is my preferred method of building wealth, that it was either buy the thing or don't buy the thing. And I think if if not having the thing is the alternative with no kind of payoff later, well, we're humans. Who's not going to buy the thing? So I think that kind of knowledge gap being filled and then the ethos and kind of the philosophy around frugality and minimalism it was just totally game changing for me. Yeah. When you set that up, I love that missing piece, right? Like the compounding, because when you set it up as, hey, do I spend now or do I spend later? Why the heck wouldn't I spend now? Right. Like I'm even sitting here answering the question to myself saying, oh, I wonder, have, have I thought about this all wrong? Well, and like evolutionarily, we haven't evolved to defer gratification. Like your your animal brain is not like, well, just in case that woolly mammoth doesn't get me 10 years <laughs> from now, I want to make sure I've got those, you know, cave paintings ready to go. Like, it's just that we have not, our prefrontal cortex is as much as we can like think that information and know it, it goes against our very nature and like how we have evolved to like prioritize the now. So yeah, I think you got to almost like hack your biology a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. And, you know, as we're talking about front loading the sacrifice, I think that's how we love to call it. Like, it is astonishing. And it's important to take a step back and say, there is never a bad time to get on the path to five. Totally. There's never a bad time to start taking action to make your life better. I think this is really critical. This show, the financial independence movement is never about 22 year olds getting it perfect from the outset or 18 year olds. Like, if that was it, we'd all wrap up shop and, you know, people who did well, did well, and everybody else, you know, you're kind of screwed. That's clearly not the case. It's at the end of the day, it's a mathematical equation, which is really liberating. I mean, as you know, we've seen people get started in their 40s and 50s and succeed wildly. And if you save 50% of your income, you're going to reach FI in 14 to 17 yeah, years. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I was talking to a friend just last night about this because she was like, telling me her income and, you know, do you think I'm saving enough? I kind of feel like I'm not saving enough. And I just, you know, asked her for all of her numbers. And I was like, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think you could be doing more. I don't think you're saving enough. And I think that you could just make these little adjustments and you're going to radically shift that timeline for yourself. And she said something that just blew my mind. And it was like, oh my God, how have I not seen this? She goes, wow, I just realized that for me, retirement never felt like an actually achievable goal. So it never felt worth trying. And that it always felt like an if and not a when, like this nebulous if. And I think when you can kind of inst install those numbers and say, no, 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 this is a mathematical certainty that if you stay on this path, this will happen. And if you stay on this path, that will happen. So there's just so much power in that to me, but it had never occurred to me that that was kind of the way that people think about it. Because I think I found and internalized the messaging so early that it's just a math problem. It's like, okay, well, I know my decisions have these consequences and I can quantify those consequences and determine how they're going to shift what's going to happen so I can make these informed decisions about my spending and saving. And I'm not just kind of relying on willpower or discipline aimed kind of directionlessly at this nebulous goal. It's like it's just a totally different framework. Yeah, I agree completely. I think the nebulous nature or, or even frankly, the drumbeat of negativity yeah. from, from the, I, I'm not one of these anti-media people by any means, but like, but you hear it in the financial media of, from the Susie Ormans of the world, oh, you need five or $10 million to retire. It's well, like, who can impossible. even conceive of that? Yeah. Why even start? Whereas, and, and I think you use the word messaging and I think, you know, I don't think about it in like a Machiavellian sense, obviously, <laughs> but like, but messaging is really important because like a messaging of hope and a messaging of certainty and control is, hey, your life costs X per year in expenses. And even if we say the 25, the 4% uh, rule, 25 times your annual expenses is just like directionally accurate or rule of thumb, as we call it, 
it's still pretty darn close. Yeah. Right? So if you take, hey, what does my life cost? Multiply that by 25. That's your fine number. That's a whole lot different than some random lady on TV telling me I need $10 million to retire when she knows nothing about me. Exactly. Oh my gosh. No, I, I completely agree. And I think that there's also the financial media obviously makes money with, you know, the what's the phrase about like you get blood in the streets and it's like that drives clicks. Like you're going to click on a negative story 10 times more than you're going to click on a positive one. So everything that we're reading right now is like the downfall of the American empire. The stock market's going to be down for the next 20 years. It's like, because it drives clicks and it gets people worked up, but it kills me because I, I feel like it's it's so it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Like we're we're guaranteeing our own you know negative outcome, or we're guaranteeing that our, our people people kind of broadly, or like Americans in general, are going to have negative outcomes if you're telling them that the world is ending and it's not even worth trying. It's like what are we doing, you guys? This is insane. So I just yeah, I feel this like deep responsibility to like keep proliferating the message in the same way that y'all are of like, no, 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 keep the hope alive. Like there are so many options that you have, you know, this hopelessness is a profit strategy for someone else. And and if you buy into it, you're kind of feeding into it for them. Yeah. And I think because that, that drumbeat of negativity is, is so profitable. I think we all get caught up in it, but really, and we were just talking about this a couple of weeks ago on the podcast with a longtime listener, uh, Dr. Bo Loy, who was the one who, who came up with the phrase valueist, which is kind of mm. how I consider myself, which is really cool. And, and he was saying, I mean, kings, kings and queens of 100 years ago, 200 years ago, could never envision life as good as it is today oh, for just love the average citizen right, in, in the US. And that's not to say, obviously, there aren't problems and there aren't people who are struggling. It, it's not to minimize that. But like, really, think about what we have. I mean, life has never been better. And you read books like Factfulness and, and you look and you say like, the world has never been better than it is today. But yet we all go around because we hear how the doom and gloom. So what do you internalize? What do you think? You think it's negative. And I just love, I love the positive hope, the messaging that this Phi journey brings. Hey, this is Brad. I wanted to let you know we're changing things up a little bit. I'm going away for the foreseeable future from traditional advertising, and we're actually going to partner with some of my favorite podcasts to cross-promote our shows. So they tell their audience about Chooseify, and I tell you, our community, about, again, some of my favorite shows. So it works out beautifully. So give them a try. Hit subscribe, check them out, and let me know what you think. I listen to a lot of podcasts. The Tim Ferriss Show has always been my favorite by far, but for the first time ever, there's a real rival for that top spot. It's a show called My First Million. When I see a new episode show up in my podcast player, it's a drop everything and listen kind of situation for me. The show is all about business building and growth hacking, from how to make $1,000 in a weekend type side hustles to billion dollar ideas and everything in between. The show is fun, it's infectious, the hosts, Sam Parr and Sean Perry, have an amazing rapport. In fact, if you're a longtime Choose a Buy fan, I think you'll find it's the closest thing to me and Jonathan you've ever heard. And Sam and Sean are legit. They've built and sold eight-figure businesses to HubSpot and Amazon, and they have an amazing network of friends and colleagues they get on the show to share their wisdom. If I lost everything and had to start over from scratch, I can honestly say the first place I'd start is with my first million. I think the mindset of business building they cultivate is unmatched, so I'd seriously just listen to every episode in their feed and go from there. The show is a little bit of an acquired taste, but as you get to know Sam and Sean, you'll see just how brilliant they are. So take my word for it and listen to at least a handful of episodes. I think you'll love it. So search for My First Million, that's My First Million, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So... I did want to kind of pivot. You said in passing that, so the stock market is your uh, preferred source of wealth building. So talk me through, because again, kind of like nuts and bolts. So you're obviously saving a decent bit of money now. Anybody who follows your journey knows. What does that, like how has your investing strategy evolved, if it has at all? And, and I think a lot of times people wonder like, oh, do people who are making more money or saving more money? Like, do they have some exotic investments <laughs> or like, what are they doing? What are they thinking about? And, and I don't mean that necessarily as flippantly as I'm saying it because, no, 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 because, because it's a mean. legitimate question, right? But like, I don't have any exotic investments. Maybe, maybe you do, but, but I'd love to hear 
where you've been on your journey of, of like the nuts and bolts of investing. Yes. So I guess I first want to quickly qualify why the stock market is my preferred method. I know that people have different approaches and philosophies around investing. My personal investing philosophy is that I only invest in things that I understand. I need to understand why this thing has value, where the underlying cash flows come from. There has to be some sort of value producing side of the asset that makes sense to me. And if I cannot make sense of it, or I don't see why something has value inherently, then it is too risky for me. It is too speculative for me. And that threshold looks different for everybody. But to me, I really love the way the stock market strikes that balance between ease of, there's practically no barrier to entry anymore, frankly. If you have $10 in an internet connection, you can invest in the stock market in five minutes. So I love that it's pretty much extremely passive. And I love that I know that I have that really, really strong diversification that really doesn't depend on me having any sort of savvy beyond the basics. And I say that because while I can see how rental property investing in real estate and that asset class is very powerful if you know what you're doing, I think there's quite a barrier to entry knowledge-wise that it's not as easy or as simple or as straightforward as you know we may want to believe or we may be told particularly post quantitative easing asset inflation and just you know the the prices of real estate now so i i have kind of steered clear of that asset class up until this point in my journey not to say i won't ever dabble but i have always really been gung ho on the stock market so from a nuts and bolts, what am I investing in and what is my strategy? I would say there's two layers. So the first layer is I want to be as tax advantaged as possible. And I know that there is some debate about this in the community about whether or not the 401k, the Roth IRA is worth it. There are some fringe groups that will say, if you want to retire early, you shouldn't even bother. Look, if I'm going to put 20 grand in a 401k and save $5,000 on my taxes this year as a result, that's an immediate 20%, 25% return on investment just for making, putting the cash in the account. So unless I think I can do better than that elsewhere, I don't know anyone that can't use an immediate tax break like that. So I try to make sure that I, my asset location is optimized and that I am maxing out every tax advantaged bucket that I have, keeping as much of my income, creating as much additional investable income as I can. And then with that income inside those accounts, and I am funding brokerage accounts pretty aggressively as well, just because obviously these qualified retirement accounts have limits. You know, I'm putting money in all these places, but once it's in there, I kind of have a different asset allocation strategy for each. And I really do like M1 Finance. I love the pies. I think it's just brilliant that you can kind of, you know, get these expertly built pies that are diversified thoroughly. And so I used to be on the VTSAX all day long train. That was really my my bread and butter. I think as I learned more and as I kind of got more familiar with Paul Merriman's work and learned about small cap value and how like the emerging markets ETF uh, or ETFs that that index was kind of a lifeboat in the 2000 2009 period and how we all kind of have this recency bias with the success of large cap growth in the last few years. I have expanded my horizons to include different things. So, you know, international stocks like developed markets funds, small cap, mid cap, small cap value in particular, because I did really buy into Paul Merriman's ethos about small cap value and and why it is inherently like I kind of understood after reading his book, We're Talking Millions. Oh, I I see kind of the logic behind why this asset class has a tendency to overperform over the long run. Um, emerging markets, some bond exposure. So as I got more familiar, I definitely added more thorough diversification. And I would say that my taxable brokerage account is probably invested, I would say aggressively, but not as aggressively as like my Roth IRA. Because in my head, and I'm thinking about the next 40 years, well, that Roth IRA is going to be the last thing that I touch. So that's the one where I can really push it to the limit, accept as much risk you know, as I really feel comfortable with because it has the longest time horizon. Whereas that taxable account might start getting used in 10 to 20 years from now. So I should maybe dial it down a little bit. So 
in the M1 finance ecosystem, because I know ChooseFI, you know, is is pro M1 finance, and there may be listeners that use it. I have the taxable account in the aggressive, and then the Roth IRA in the ultra aggressive, and then my 401k at work, because obviously we all, if you have a 401k through an employer, your provider determines what holdings you have access to. I have like the Vanguard 2060 in that. And I think it's like 90% Vanguard 2060 and then 10% small cap value. So that's like the two funds for life model that Paul Merriman and Chris Peterson will talk about. So I definitely think I've I've learned more and I've tried to be open-minded to this idea that there is on that macro scale, this argument against passive or this idea that like people have compared it to a pyramid scheme. And I think that's a little insane, but but there are some uh, some veritable grievances that people have about too much money in the market that's just flowing into passive and not enough people actively actively investing. But at the end of the day, for me, I don't think I should be the one trying to seek a price signal. I don't think I should be the one trying to set market prices. And I, I really do believe that if it ever got to a point where there was too much passive, well, now you have arbitrage opportunities, right? So some active investor is going to come in and exploit that and get the price signal back to where it needs to be. So I'm pretty optimistic that if you hold a diversified bundle of low cost ETFs, like to me, that's as good of a guarantee as you are going to get in this life that you are going to be very wealthy someday. Yeah, that's how I conceptualize it also. It's like, what's my highest likelihood of success yeah. over 50 years? And I think for me, where I come down on that, yeah, it's similar in that keeping my expense ratios low, trying to have as broad based of uh, exposure as I can get is where I am at this point. I think my ability and interest in picking individual stocks is uh, is limited at best. So I don't even try to play that game. Again, it's like, what are you optimizing for? Right? I think that's that's a question that I'm always considering. And And for me, a lot of it is just ease and highest likelihood of matching the market. And if I can match the market over 50 years with essentially negligible expenses, I am thrilled with that. Same. I would add to that. I think sometimes we focus so much energy or feel like we should be devoting our energy to trying to outperform or to perfect those holdings. But I think it's a little self-defeating in that what's ultimately going to determine how much you have later is far more a factor of how much you're saving than what you are investing those savings in, I think, within reason, right? Like, you know, if I have a diversified portfolio that's perfectly diversified versus like 85% there or like all VTSAX, like th- that ultimately, like we're quibbling over these incremental one, two percent differences. What really matters is how much you're saving. And I think focusing then on increasing income and lowering expenses is going to be time far better spent. And frankly, it's something that is far more in your control than kind of ass- assessing and perfecting like what those holdings are going to do. Yeah. And that locus of control, I mean, that goes back to what we were talking about before, just with the entire concept of FI, right, is it truly is in your control. It's what does my life cost times 25. And that's, there's just a lot of comfort and certainty in that, even if, again, it is a rule of thumb. It's not like a mathematical guarantee, but but within reason, we can always come, is it a 4%? Yeah. Safe withdrawal rate is at 3.25. Like we can run all the Monte Carlo simulations, but <laughs> but it's pretty darn close to that. And yeah, just as a sidebar to the audience. So uh, Katie, obviously you've heard Paul Merriman on this show yes. uh, multiple times. So he was on episode 130 and then again in episode 290. And you also mentioned, yeah, I know Jonathan absolutely loved M1 Finance and still loves it to yeah. this day. We had a, it's a great we have an article we'll put in the show notes about M1 pies. And one of them actually is Paul Merriman's ultimate buy and hold strategy. So literally you can click on that. It'll take you to M1 (laughs) and you can replicate his ultimate buy and hold worldwide, you know, his strategy. So there are a lot of positives of, of using M1. So definitely wanted to mention that since, uh, you know, maybe you heard Paul, uh, on the show. I did. (laughs) That's very cool. All right, Katie, one thing I, I wanted to ask you was, uh, Actually, I know you just got married recently. So uh, huge congrats to you and your husband. (laughs) And I'm curious about combining finances, because this is definitely a topic that I think maybe has even changed. Again, I'm a little bit older than you, but I don't (laughs) consider myself an old geezer compared to you. But like, but I think even just in the generation or thereabouts in between us, it may have shifted a little bit. My wife and I immediately combined our finances and it was kind of like a no brainer for us. 
And maybe that's old fashioned now. And, I, and I'm curious, what did you and your husband do? And, and what do you see a lot of people in their 20s and 30s who are getting married or, or what, as it may be, what are they doing? And what, what do you advise? Well, I hear far more than I would have expected people keeping things completely separate. And I think that that's fine if that's what works for you. The only thing that I would caution to what I'll kind of call the roommate model of money in marriage is that it's okay if you guys decide that what works best for you is to determine your joint expenses to allocate whether it's the same amount each if you earn similar amounts or maybe one earner earn substantially more. And so you want to do a proportional thing to put that money in checking and then use that for expenses. And then you both get to separately keep whatever else and do whatever you want with it. I think that that works in theory. The only thing that I would caution is have the conversation up front about the retirement 40 years from now. And what are the expectations that you have for one another about saving? Because the last thing that I think you want is you're maintaining separate financial lives. Everything's going fine. You're paying your bills. And then you turn 55 and it's like, oh, well, I've been diligently saving all this time and I have $2 million. And you look at your spouse and they say, what? Like I've been spending everything. I got nothing. So then does that become your responsibility as a diligent saver to now fund the retirement for the both of you? Do they just have to keep working until they have enough money to stop? Are you going to kick them out of the house because they can't afford their half of the groceries? Like I think it just introduces some complexity and challenges that if you think through them ahead of time, you're you're okay, great, perfect. Like go on your merry way. But that's the thing that I, I don't think people think about on the spending side, probably because it's unusual on the individual basis to even be thinking about those things. That's not common. I think like we need to make it more of a thing. But for us personally, and why I think it's more common that people are keeping things separate now, I can't remember off the top of my head the statistic about average marriage age but it has been increasingly getting later in life that people are marrying. And so they're coming into relationships with more assets and liabilities of their own because they've lived more life than had they gotten married at 21. I mean, you probably, you don't own anything, so you have no liabilities, but you also, uh, you know, you have no assets either. My husband and I both had, at the time we got married legally in June, 2021, around like 200 or $250,000 a piece and so because we had a similar amount of money that was pretty, you know, just coincidentally in lockstep, we basically said, okay, we're not going to do the prenup thing because there's really nothing to protect. If we were to get like, we, we would combine this and split right, it down the middle, it it's going to give us both the same that we came in with. So we ended up not doing a prenup, but we basically once married said, okay, we are now going to open a joint checking account and everything that comes into that joint checking account you know, is going to be our full paychecks. All of our income is going to go into that account. All of our expenses are going to get paid out of that account. And then our investments, aside from the the retirement accounts that are individual by nature that are being funded through our work, the investing that we are doing is all going to go into a joint brokerage account. So we have really combined from the marriage point forward, but we did not retroactively combine the money that we had in individual brokerage accounts or retirement accounts. It was kind of like, that stuff can be in your name. This stuff will be in my name. Ultimately, it's all going to get spent by both of us or get passed down to our children. So that doesn't really matter. But like moving forward now, we're a team and everything's coming in together. Everything's going out together. Everything's getting saved together. So that ultimately works for us. And I think it kind of comes down to comfort levels. And and obviously it's always like an interesting conversation and marriage around like, well, what does it mean if you don't trust your spouse with your money? Like, is that something that you should look into? Or like, is that something you can live with? So I think it's an interesting conversation because oftentimes the way people approach it has very little to do with money and a lot more to do with like the relationship itself and their personality. Yeah. And that does that portend larger issues right. as you're kind of alluding to there. Yeah, I, I think I would echo what you said about it. it really it comes down to communication, it comes down to having having these discussions. And it truly is very personal. I don't think there's a right answer, though. I would tend to agree with you that I think that that roommate model, as you kind of uh, so eloquently called it, <laughs> that, that seems quite fraught with peril. I mean, that's, yes, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for not that there's not for fully combining for things to go wrong. Like that's absolutely 
both can go wrong if one or both people are not approaching it like truthfully. But I do think that there are more questions that have to be answered at the outset with the roommate model in order for it to be successful. Agreed. And that truly is where communication comes in. But, you know, I can certainly just kind of last word from me on this is I can see how it's important that people have separate money and and feel some level of autonomy and not that every purchase is being looked over their shoulder, right. especially like you said, if people are coming in slightly later in life and they've been living an adult life for years, potentially decades, like you don't want to feel like there's a big brother or somebody oh, looking absolutely. over your shoulder, right? So, you know, I, I think there's a happy medium there. So- well, thank you for giving us a little insight into your own life there. For sure. So Katie, this has been amazing. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. And we actually, are, uh, we are bringing back the hot seat. So it's been a couple of years, but we're bringing back the hot seat. So are you up for uh, answering some questions? I am ready. All right, let's do it. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. Okay, Katie, question number one, your favorite blog, podcast, or book? Or a couple of you, or whatever you want. (laughs) So I think for, I'm going to go book. And I'm going to go Quit Like a Millionaire by Christy Shen and Bryce Long because I think it's just the most concise description of like everything you need to know. Just boom. You read that book, you're good. Go do what it says and you'll be fine. You don't have to read anything else. That's funny. I am not surprised by the answer just because if you go to moneywithkatie.com, there's this uh, really amusing picture of you with a a pencil across (laughs) your, your upper lip, which is a great, great picture, by the way. And I noticed this morning for the first time that under your coffee mug is Quit Like a Millionaire. Yep. It's funny too. That picture we get, there's this one person <laughs> that emails us, but just goes to show that like the, the larger your audience gets, the more strange people you're going to find. But there's this person that was incessantly emailing us every single week for like a month or two being like, I don't know why, but I hate that pencil mustache photo so much. Please change it. Like I'm begging you to change it. It bothers me so much. And really? I was like, look, I'm not changing it. <laughs> No. Normally it's a hit, but yeah, every once in a while you'll get, it's just funny that you bring that oh, up because I, we always joke about pencil gate and this person that was like very, <laughs> very triggered by the pencil mustache. Yeah. I guess that's one of the, uh, the downsides obviously, as you kind of see a broad swath of people and you know, listen, 1% of people, unfortunately are always going to find something to be aggrieved yeah. about. So, or <laughs> maybe more than 1%, but, but yeah, I, I love the picture. I think it's fantastic. So, Thank you. all right. Uh, question number two, an inflection point in your life that was especially memorable or meaningful? I'm not just saying this because I'm on Choose FI right now, but finding Choose FI. I think I say that because it didn't just send my financial life on a completely different path, but like my entire life. I would probably still live in Dallas. I'd probably still work for the same company. I would probably have a net worth that's 10% of what it is now without this show. So I would say it really changed and started everything for me about how my life is now, what I do for work. And so, yeah, I mean, sincerely, thank you for being you. And thank you, Jonathan, who's obviously not sitting here with us right now. But um, yeah, finding Choose FI. That is amazing. Jonathan's here with us in spirit, certainly. Yes. But that is amazing. That's like one of these uh, chills moments. So Aww. that's, uh, I, I just love, it's amazing. We talked about the ripple effects with Landon, right? And and you just never know what kind of ripple effect you're going to have in life, no matter who you are, where, where you are. And it's, uh, it's incredible. So I'm so glad to hear that, Katie. All right. Question number three. So your favorite life hack. Now, I don't love that term, but I think you know where we're going. So yeah. general life hack. Totally. This is a basic one, but waking up early. Like it has gotten to the point that if I wake up past seven, I feel like my entire day is gone. Like I love waking up when it's still dark outside and eating my breakfast and drinking my little coffee and exercising like feeling like I've got that jump on the day. It just makes the biggest difference for me. So I would say, yeah, that like rooster wake up call has been my secret sauce. Nice. Yeah. I'm certainly an early waker. I love to get up and have an hour or so of a quiet house to myself. I'm even now doing, I listen to, uh, the Andrew Huberman podcast, Huberman oh, Lab. I love so Huberman Lab. It's amazing. Right. So I'm getting my morning sunlight in the morning. First thing, yes. uh, 
early low angle sunlight. So, you know, try, trying to do all I the... think about that every time I walk my dog at like 6 a.m. I'm like staring at the sun, but trying not to look at it. <laughs> the too sun's at 4%, <laughs> 4 percent, yeah, 4 I'm degrees like, over the horizon. Low angle light. <laughs> yeah. That's so awesome. Uh, all right. Question number four, your biggest financial mistake. Well, as we've talked about, I'm very fortunate that I found Phi in my early 20s because it prevented me from, I think, making a lot of the mistakes that I otherwise would have and circumvented that. But I do think the thing that I regret most looking back is like a mistake of omission as opposed to something I did and wish I hadn't. I wish I would have tried house hacking when I was still single and kind of in that like post-grad period of life. Even though the property taxes in Dallas at the time where I lived were high, uh, I think with house hacking, it still would have been a, a pretty strong net positive. And, and given the time frame that I'm thinking of here, 2018, it meant that I would have gained a lot of equity on that kind of like real estate upswing that we've seen in the last couple of years where 2018 would have been like the perfect time or 2019 with the low interest rates and asset values being a little bit lower than they are now. So I think it's just bad timing on my end because I had no idea what was coming. And now with where I am in life, I'm married, my current income, my current lifestyle, and the price of multifamily real estate post you know, asset inflation and everything that's happened over the last couple of years, it's no longer really an attractive or viable option to me personally. So I just kind of feel like I missed out on it. Like, oh, I should have done that when I first graduated. I wish I would have had like the wherewithal to, to make something like that happen because I think it could have been really powerful. Yeah. Agreed. I've always been jealous of people like Scott Trench who talk about yes. it and they just, they hit it from the beginning. I love Scott. I got breakfast with him in Fort Collins a couple of months ago and, and we were kind of talking about that. I was like, God, I'm so envious that you like, that you just, you pulled that off. You just went for it. I'm like, look at you now. <laughs> yeah. Look at him now, right? He's the CEO yeah. of Bigger Pockets and Bigger Pockets Money podcast. So yeah, good stuff. All right, Kitty, next question. What purchase have you made in, let's say the last 12 months or so, it doesn't have to be exact, has added the most value to your life? I think my like splurgy convenience purchases, back when I was hardcore frugal and making less money, I would never dream of outsourcing anything because I was like, why would I pay someone else to do something I can do? But now that I have more money and less time, I've kind of tried to get that back into equilibrium by outsourcing cooking and cleaning. So I spend a small fortune on food and housework every month. I think people would gag if they knew like how much money <laughs> we spend on those things. But at this phase in my life where I like really need to be singularly focused on my work and, and have that energy solely devoted to these things, it just makes a world of difference for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have any uh, interesting tips on the cooking specifically? So do you have like someone come in and like a private chef or do you uh, have a delivery service or how does... Uh... Yeah. So we, so I would say if someone's interested in doing this, I went on Nextdoor in my area and just searched the Fort Collins feed for chef. And then I ended up finding a local female owned business where for, I would consider, I mean, it's astronomical for like the $2 per meal five calculation, but it's pretty affordable comparatively to how much it would cost us to, you know, buy the groceries and then cook them ourselves and, you know, meal plan and all of that and the kind of the time value of money that you're getting back. So we spend probably for two people $200 a week on having her, you know, we buy several entrees and several sides. And then every Monday they come and just drop off all the containers and we have food for the week. So it's pretty fantastic. I think it will vary on where you live, but I was surprised that even in a small town like this one, there, there were several huh. like chef services that you could hire. And this just happened to be the one that I felt like was the best like cost value assessment for us and, and kind of the, the lowest price point that I was happy with. So yeah, I would say check next door, ask neighbors. Like I think you'd be probably surprised. There are, there are a lot of like scrappy small businesses like that that can take that off your hands. I like that. I like that a lot. That's very cool. So yeah, I could probably spend the next 15 minutes uh, peppering you with questions <laughs> on that, but we'll move on. I've got two kind of newish questions here. So Sweet. what is... I, I guess either your your goal travel destination or maybe like your best travel reward success. I know there are two mm. kind of different questions, but I'd love to hear. So goal destination right now, I really want to go to the south of France, like Provence. I just have, I read a book about it and now I'm like, ooh, that sounds really cool. Best redemption that I've had recently. So I recently went to Scandinavia. I talk about Scandinavia and annoying, I feel like Bernie Sanders. And I'm like the Scandinavian model <laughs> of everything. But I went to Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. It was a utopia. I fell in love. I'd love to live there at some point. But anyway, I had booked our seats on United going over our tickets from Denver to Denmark. And 
the redemption value on the seats themselves was already pretty good. I transferred Amex points to Air Canada, and then I booked United seats on Air Canada because they're code share partners and the Air Canada redemption values are pr- pretty dang good. So I spent 40,000 points on my seat to Denmark and then 40,000 more on my husband's. And then at check-in, I took the upgrade offer. I guess they didn't have very many people in first class. So the offer to upgrade the seat for this nine-hour flight to the live flat Polaris business class was like 500 bucks. So I spent 40,000 points and $500 per seat for a seat that I then like before, you know, I went back and checked like, how much does this cost out of pocket if I were to just go to United's website and try to buy a Polaris seat on this route. It's like a $15,000 seat. So I was on top of the world. I felt like a magician for that one. That's awesome. Wow, that's so cool. And on a flight like that long, and if it's a red eye- And it was overnight. I'm like, you want to sleep. Like You don't want to be sitting there like right before you start this week-long vacation all tired. Yeah, it was perfect. Nice. That's a nice little splurge. That seems well worth it. I love it. All right, last question. Where do you come down on the paying off your mortgage early or not? So it's funny you ask this. As a renter, I, no, I'm kidding. Um, I used to be absolutely in the like, why the hell would you do that camp? Why would you pay down early? That is. And the Wall Street Journal actually came out like two days ago with this article about how with bond yields right now that are actually higher than most of the interest rates that people have from refinancing over the last couple of years, it really doesn't make sense because it's no longer even a gamble of like, what is the stock market going to do? It's guaranteed. Like if there are fixed income instruments that can more than compensate you for the mortgage interest, you know, why wouldn't you? But now I'm really in the camp of like, if someone has run the numbers and they still want to pay it off early, that's no skin off my nose. Like, I don't care. I feel the same way about the renting versus buying thing. As long as you've run the numbers and you know what you're getting yourself into either way, please just make the decision that feels right for you and best fits your personality. Like, I'm not a landlord. I'm not a mortgage lender. So I have no skin in the game either way. I don't care. I'm not going to push one way or the other. I just feel strongly that people make financial decisions from a very confident, fully informed place. Like I think the math will tell you in your situation what makes the most sense. But as long as you know the math, when you're making whatever decision that makes sense for you, like that is a win for me. Brilliant. I love it. Absolutely love it. Katie, this has been a real blast. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. So if people are looking to find you online or get in touch with you, what would be the best way or or the best ways, let's say? (laughs) Well, thank you, Brad. The pleasure is all mine. So I'm pretty much money with Katie everywhere. Money with Katie on Twitter, Instagram, like this very nascent TikTok that I spend no time on because that app fries my brain and I'm trying to, you know, protect some semblance of my attention span. <laughs> um, moneywithkatie.com. And then of course, if you're a podcast buff, the Money with Katie show on any major podcast player and you will get to listen to my voice for hours on end, which... <laughs> What could be better? What more could you want? (laughs) And maybe even see as the cover art to the show, the the famous pencil picture. The famous pencil mustache. That's correct. (laughs) (laughs) Money with Katie show. It's fantastic. So I am a subscriber and a listener. And uh, yeah, Katie, (laughs) this is wonderful. Thanks again for, for coming on. My pleasure. 